How to properly claim disability and retirement benefits on Form I-864 Affidavit of Support. By the end of this video, you will learn what documents need to be attached with your I-864, what mistakes cause the highest number of requests for evidence, and how to avoid it in your case. We've helped so many couples navigate this journey effectively by avoiding issues like this, just like Marie and Matt who got through their process without any delays, and you can hear their full story here. If you just want straight to the point, step-by-step -step guidance through your entire marriage immigration journey with no no waste of time, you can speak to us directly by using the link in the description below. Let's get to the first thing you need to know. I'm about to share some general info, but it's important since some couples are unaware that the I-864 is a requirement at all, so they often fail to submit this form altogether. Form I-864 or the affidavit of support is required for marriage adjustment of status to show that an intending immigrant spouse adequate means of financial support and is not likely to become a public charge. This affidavit is a contract between sponsors U.S. citizens sponsoring their spouse and the U.S. government. You must show in this affidavit that you have enough income and or assets to maintain the intending immigrant and the rest of your household at 125% of the federal poverty guidelines. If you're wondering what those numbers are, you first have to count your household size and then verify if your income is sufficient by looking at the most recent poverty guidelines, which we've included the link under this video. All right, moving on. You do need to know that things can become a bit tricky when we talk about disability or retirement benefits since that is non taxable income. According to the USCIS instructions, non-taxable income, other than means-tested subsistence funds, which for instance VA disability is not, can be applied towards meeting the affidavit of support requirements. You just have to include proof of the nature and amount of income. That being said, in practice, when it comes to the USCIS, they really want to see taxable income, meaning filed and sufficient tax transcript and current employment. So then, how does that apply to disabled veterans and retired individuals? Let's start this conversation with disabled veterans first. If let's say you have current employment, thus sufficient taxable income and file taxes last calendar year. It's a standard and straightforward situation. If that's not the case, then there would be no tax transcript as the VA disability would be non-taxable and the IRS wouldn't even accept a return from you because nothing would be owed. That's where we see a huge number of requests for evidence, basically stating that the sponsor does not qualify based on income. We receive requests for support in these cases all the time, even when the VA benefits letter, all the necessary additional evidence, and the letter explaining the situation is attached with the initial submission. In that case, you really have two options. Either we submit that same evidence and hope that the USCIS doesn't deny your application or find a joint sponsor, which is obviously inconvenient for many people. So then how do you avoid it altogether? First, you could supplement your income with assets, which you can find under part seven of the form. I will give you a warning regarding this approach later in the video, but you do need to know that it is an option. And that is, of course, in addition to properly completing form I, it's 64 following your specific situation, which I will clarify on this point in just a moment as well, including a personal statement slash cover letter properly explaining the matter, VA benefit and disability information letter, DD214, past 12 months of bank statements from the account that receives the direct deposit, and the VA ID card. If including assets on this form is not an option in your case, then you skip that, but still attach all the paperwork mentioned here. Regarding properly completing form I-864, sometimes it might make sense not to indicate that an individual is unemployed and instead select employed on the form, employed as a disabled veteran with the employer being U.S. Veterans Administration. Look, for you it's the first time dealing with the USCIS in this capacity and it might seem silly to be doing all this extra work, but in practice with how many RFEs they issue in these specific scenarios, you actually have an opportunity to get ahead of it and potentially avoid it. The whole idea here is to give them as much information as possible ahead of time so they don't come asking for more because this request for evidence will certainly throw you off. It's stressful either way. If you're handling this process yourself, you will go into a wild Google mode and finding the solution is never easy, especially when your case and all the filing fees are now on the line. If you're working with a lawyer, well, they will most likely charge you extra to address it, so it's really best to handle this right from the start. These USCIS RFE letters are confusing copy-paste text, not at all explaining what went wrong. They won't tell you anything aside from the sponsor does not qualify based on income. And that's when you will have to consider, okay, so do I get a joint sponsor, somebody who has a high enough income, is a W-2 employee and files taxes, or do I file this one by resubmitting the same information 
information I submitted the first time. And there are, of course, a lot of risks involved when it comes to fighting it. They might accept whatever you resubmit the second time, or they might deny the I-485. In that case, you will be faced with another challenge of whether to appeal that decision and the appeal has a filing fee, or refile the I-485 again, which also has a filing fee, and you will be totally, well, frustrated and overwhelmed throughout that entire experience. If you still have questions or comments regarding what we just covered, please drop them in the comments and we will make sure to address it. Alrighty then, so what about the retirement benefits? Sometimes these two go hand in hand, but sometimes it's a separate thing. Either way, it's very similar to the first point. You would want to properly fill out the form and include sufficient supporting evidence such as personal statement describing your situation, SSA, 1099 tax document or 1099R, a letter from Social Security verifying your payments or a declaration letter from the VA, plus past 12 months of bank statements from the account that receives the direct deposit. You can again supplement income with assets in this case, but just know that it is not a requirement. If your income or the total income for your household exceeds the federal poverty guidelines for your household size, you can skip the assets portion of the form. Keep in mind that only assets that can be converted into cash within one year and without considerable hardship of financial loss to the owner can be included. You would have to include a description of the asset, proof of the ownership, and the basis for the owner's claim of its net cash value. I will also say that we've heard a lot of negative experiences with using assets on this form. Often people are discouraged from doing it and rather advised to use a joint sponsor instead. The rationale behind it is that proving assets is difficult and also often results in an RFE. For instance, how do you assess the real value of the property? You need to get an expensive appraisal, etc. We've never had an experience like that and using a county assessor website usually works just fine. Just remember that whatever you are claiming on Form I, it's you have to back that up with strong evidence. But that's it for now. Like this video and we'll see you next time.